<laughs> okay, so I'm just going to read from Acts chapter 2, just as a reminder as to what we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks, uh, starting at verse 42. So Acts chapter 2, 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being served. So Gary's been breaking this down for us. And in verse 42, where it talks about devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And today we're going to be focusing on the breaking of bread. But if you can remember, yes, uh, last week we talked about the fellowship and how important fellowship is. And um, a story to tell you is that when I was younger... I don't know, 15 years younger. Um, I can remember waking up on the couch one night. Yeah, sometimes you sit on the couch and you're watching TV and you fall asleep and you wake up, you're like, where am I? Anyway, there was this music clip playing and I remember quite quite vividly there was a music clip play, playing and I heard the song and when you wake up out of the, uh, sort of out of a dream, I looked and oh, wow, that's an awesome song. You know, this song and just stuck in my head and I... I remember thinking, oh, what a great song it was, and then coming to, I think, church the next day and talking to a few people and sitting down at lunch and talking to my brother about it. I said, oh, I heard this awesome song last night. It was like the best song I've ever heard. And he says, go back and think about it and listen to it again. And I did, and I thought, that's not that good. <laughs> so sometimes you can get caught up in you know, what do you think is a great idea. So when you're on your own, you know, you have thoughts running through your head and you can con- concoct wonderful Visions for the future. But it's not till you meet with other people and throw those ideas around with people that you start to get a better picture of what it's all about. And not just with people who are like, like I could have got together with a bunch of people who I knew love that song and said, oh, this is a wonderful song, this is the best song I've ever heard. And they would have said, oh, yeah, it's a great song, yeah. And they'd pat me on the back and they'd reinforce the fact that it was a great song. But when you meet with other people who, and I trust my brother's musical abilities for some unknown reason. I was just saying before, I'm the only non-musical person in my family. Um, And so when you start to rub shoulders with other people who you trust, you start to realise that not all my thoughts that I have on my own are good thoughts. Not all the thoughts I have on my own are helpful thoughts. Not all the visions for the future that I have for myself are good visions. And so the whole idea of meeting together is to take those thoughts which you've, you've concocted on your own, in your own time, through all these different things that come into your head, and then bounce them off people. And as the Bible talks about uh, being iron sh- that sharpens iron, or being like the uh, rocks in a cement mixer, that as they spin around, you knock the rough edges off. It is important to meet together. I'm not just saying come to church every Sunday morning and meet together. It's important to meet together to talk to one another, to bounce ideas off one another, not just hang out with the like-minded, but to bounce ideas off with people of all walks of life so that we get a balanced picture of who God is, of what his vision and purpose is for my life and then walk together sort of with level heads, if you know what I mean. That's what I've learned for the last week or so from Acts chapter 2. I hope you've been learning something as well. We have a Bible reading, and it comes from John chapter 6. So if you'd like to open your Bibles up to John chapter 6, there is a story which you'd be very familiar with. John chapter 6, verse 5. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have just a bite. 
Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had eaten enough, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. I heard a really good testimony um, at the beginning of the week. A pastor was sharing from over at Griffith that um, somebody a few months ago had come into church and uh, Griffith is filled with lots of people who come from overseas and work in Griffith. There's plenty of small farms to work on and uh, quite labour intensive. And uh, this guy, a Bangladeshi, had come and walked into the church and uh, in sort of broken English, barely knows any English at all. So they had to find somebody who was gifted in tongues and they found Google and (laughs) did Google Translate uh, for him. And he said, I would like to be baptised. I'd like to become a Christian. And so using uh, the translator, they went backwards and forwards and he um, brought him through uh, and explained the gospel to him through Google Translate which is a bit of a challenge. But he said this guy was so keen to become a Christian, it it really shocked him. It actually really warmed his heart because he's wondering whether or not anything is happening in the church. Is God doing anything? But he told his story, the Bangladeshi guy, that he was Hindu and... Uh, He had wanted to become a Christian while he was in Bangladesh, uh, but they had beaten him. And so the opportunity came for him to come to Australia. He did, and he thought, I might turn up at a church and see if they would allow me to become a Christian. And so he said that this, it just amazed him how keen he was that his former belief gave him no value, no reason uh, to live. And so uh, last week they um, baptised him and uh, used Google Translate to help. It's amazing. In in many ways I I see the way in which uh, these disciples who have come from all over uh, the then known world to come and then have committed their life and say, Jesus is Lord and Saviour. And they devote themselves, firstly, to the apostles' teaching. We want to listen to what they have to say about who Jesus is and how we understand the Old Testament and the sacrifices, etc. And then they turn and they say, well, we want to devote ourselves to fellowship. That's where we're going to grow. And now it comes to... The breaking of bread, what does that mean? There's very little explanation except to say that in the um, next few verses to say they did it by going to the um, temple but they also did it informally in homes. They broke bread in their homes. So what does it mean to break bread? Uh, I think the easy or the, the best way to picture it is Uh, a description of how the presence of the Lord Jesus is with us. And so every time they had a meal together, they would break bread. And the the picture that they seem to give us is this of 
Let us remember who Jesus is. You know, like you can have teaching and you can go down that line, you can have fellowship, but if you don't have a cornerstone on which it's based, you can go off in all different places. So there is this constant reminder of the Lord Jesus is with us. It is through his blood and his body that is broken for us that he uh, saves us. They met together in the temple courts. There's a few things that I want to say. Um, <clears throat> Jesus uses bread quite often as a description to describe this is a physical thing that we need and it's pointing towards a spiritual thing that we actually need. We actually need to have not just a, a substance for our physical body to live, we also need food for our soul. One of the examples that happened and uh, when we had Arthur King, it wasn't those who were the weakest who died. It's those who had given up on life that died. Given up on living. So as our bodies call for food and cry out, and I've just been hearing in my house the last couple of weeks, I'm hungry. <laughs> and, and you go, wow, that's, you know, it, it's just little pains inside a little tummy saying, wow, I'm hungry. And just goes for it. But also our souls cries out, you know, I need a reason. I need substance. Our bodies need food, clothing, exercise, but our soul needs companionship, hope, purpose. Jesus. So I've got three questions I want to ask. One is that what does Jesus reveal when he broke bread? What does he reveal? What does he want to show? What does he want to teach us when he points to hear his bread? The second question is, what natural resistance do I have to Jesus? You know, like we take up things and there are things that actually hold us back from coming to Jesus. And the third one is, what shall we practice? In light of this teaching, what would we practice? As a church, together, as, as we come together, whether formally or informally, what will we practice? Well, the first thing, the first question, what does Jesus reveal when he broke bread? I wanted to use um, chapter 6 because John in John's Gospel doesn't use the usual things that we talk about when feeding the 5,000. It says in verse 5 that Jesus looks up and he saw a great crowd coming towards him and he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked him only to test him because he already had in mind what he was going to do. The other Gospels sort of talk about, well, he goes ahead and teaches and heals people, but John just misses that and he says, I want to make the point, okay, where shall we buy food? Where shall we get food to feed these people? And Philip turns around and he said, well, half a year's wages won't only give them a bite. And Jesus is talking about filling them. So calculate that one out. 5,000 people, that's a half a year's wages, and they get one bite. I mean, how much will our blokes, ladies in here who take care of the kitchen. How many bites will it take to fill our blokes in here? More than one. Two? Three? Seven. <laughs> John, you had your hand up. Oh, I'm thinking higher. Higher. You're going higher. You never know when you're going to get your next meal. <laughs> So he asks the question, and the disciples, and I love, um, was it Andrews? Andrew, he turns around and he says, look, I found a kid and he's got a lunchbox. <laughs> so he took, he's willing to share. 
He's got five small loaves and two fish, but how far will they go? They go. Well, between the half a year's wages plus uh, the lunchbox, and I've seen Toby's lunchbox, and a little, little tiger comes home and he's got some left. And I uh, thought, wow, if I was a kid, I would have demolished that. <laughs> So, what does it tell us? It says <clears throat> that he gave thanks, broke it, and t- uh, distributed it around. And he gave it to his disciples to distribute. And it's sort of like, imagine the disciples here, like, there's 12 of them, right? You've got five loaves, so that means you're breaking those in half and some of it you've got to break again. I don't know how many, what percentage of that so you're giving them and then they go around in groups uh to the five thousand they're breaking and this this blessing of the bread just keeps on growing and growing and growing and through jesus uh there is blessing for people so much so that everybody gets filled and everybody has enough and as you know the story there's even leftovers and what do you do with leftovers sorry Eat them the next day. Yeah, so you, but you don't waste it. No, I mean, sometimes we see waste, but generally we try and find a way to be able to keep it. And Jesus says, don't waste any. Keep it. And so the first thing that we learn is that Jesus blesses us with what we have. And it multiplies and... And sometimes you think that there isn't enough for the next lot, the next person, etc. But he's asking the disciples, you distribute to the rest of them. And so they do. The second thing that we learn is that you can't earn it. The part that we didn't actually read is that the people decide to go and find Jesus He disappeared, the disciples have disappeared, the people are still there, they hop in a boat, they run around the side and they go in search of Jesus and they find him. And they ask him when they find him over on the other side, he said, how'd you get here? But then the next question is even better. He said, well, what must we do to do the works required? Because Jesus has said, look, Uh, I performed a sign, but you didn't actually chase me because I did a sign. You chased me because you ate and had your fill. Don't work for what spoils, but work for what lasts. And they said, well, give us, what must we do to the work? What must we do to do the work that God requires? See, the people are wondering, well, how do I get this extra blessing? What more do I need to do to get further ahead? And Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. I, I know that we struggle how... Um, that I actually have to do something. It's what we get trained to do ever since we're little, that we got to work for our living and so they're thinking the same we've got to work for some blessing here from God we need to do that is culture you don't just get things uh, as a freebie and passed on to you how what must I do believe believe in the one he has sent And so they ask, what's the sign that you will give us? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert. And so he's all of a sudden, he's going back. So our forefathers ate manna in the desert because it says he gave us bread from heaven. And Jesus says, verily, verily, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you bread. It was my father who gives you true bread from heaven for bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. One of the things that I want um, for us to learn is that 
It is a gift. And you can't earn it. You cannot earn the favour of God, the blessing of God. He continues to say, I am actually the bread that comes down from heaven. I am the thing that will sustain you. I am the thing that doesn't spoil. I am the thing that is here today and tomorrow and the next day. I am with you. And so they struggle with that. I will promise to give you what your soul requires. It is a gift from God. And then on top of that, he says, for all those the Father gives me. For all those the Father gives me. In other words, God is, the Father is saying, here, I would like you to have this person, Lord Jesus. My son, you are to have this one. And then it says, and they will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. There is security. He will never, ever abandon you. Can you walk away? Yes. They're not, it's not talking about that. The people are wondering, how can I have this bread that sustains me all the time? John has been making a habit of this in his gospel. The woman beside the well. How is it? that I don't have to keep on drawing water. If you're going to give me living water, I want that. He sustains us. The reminder of bread is that he will always sustain you. Whether you will not be thirst, your soul will not go hungry, it will not go thirsty. It does not say like um, Paul uh, encourages, he said, I'm trying to think of the verse now about Romans, that there is um, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. It doesn't say all things are good because God is trying to refine our souls and give so sustenance to our souls. We seem to be travelling through this life where we want a Panadol for our soul. Something that will just take away the pain for a time. But here Jesus is saying, I've got bread for you that will sustain your soul all the time. And it's a hard lesson for us to learn. There's another time where Jesus uses bread to describe what he is trying to do. There is a woman who is of Greek birth and comes from Phoenicia, which is basically that Gaza Strip area. And Jesus is taking a break from um, the people for a time and going outside of Israel. And this woman hears about it and he says, I, I want to find this Jesus and is annoying his disciples to say, you know, be merciful to me. And he says, it's not right to give the children's bread to dogs. And immediately the woman turns around and says, but don't dogs even eat the scraps that fall from the table? There is this really nice um, picture where even a little bit of the Lord Jesus is enough to sustain this woman and her child. Our eyes should always be towards him. She goes out of her way. She takes an insult. She says, actually, that's what I am. I recognise what I am. You see, oftentimes we want God's blessing because I need to be good enough. Smart enough, righteous enough, dressed right, done right, say the right things, all of those. And it's not. It is because of his grace. So what is our resistance to Jesus? 
The first one when it comes to blessing is that we can get the wrong picture about Jesus. Seeing that Jesus, um, the people were um, blessed and they could see this sign, they want to make Jesus king by force. We get the wrong idea or the wrong picture about who Jesus is and so he runs. He hides himself. And it is so often that we can get a picture about who Jesus is and then move and say, oh, we can do this. And then Jesus disappears. Our resistance is, what type of king do you want to make him? What kind of king do you want to make him? Are you the type of king, Jesus, that will just keep on giving and giving rather than correcting me or making and moulding me? The other one is an arrogance towards Jesus. See, there's a little bit of confusion as he goes through and he starts talking about, well, you've gone ahead and you've found me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate and you had your fill. Guess what? Uh, the people start to grumble against Jesus. How can this man say that he is bread come down from heaven? We know his parents. How can he say that? And so there's an arrogance. I don't understand. He gives us a sign that he is from God, but I know his parents. I can't reconcile that. I can't work it out. I struggle with a lot of things. And I, if I ask for a, a general um, picture... Is there anybody who's got all of scripture right and you have no questions? I take it from the lack of hands that there is not. Oh, I did see a hand. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I've been in too many auctions. You move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there are some things that we're going to struggle with and not reconcile. And so we grumble against, well, how can this be? Is one of our resistance against Jesus. If you wanted a story out of the Old Testament, I think of Nahum. And there he is, a, a commander in an Assyrian army. And he is uh, successful and victorious. He is strong and he's capable. He's boss, his king, loves him, except that he has a problem. He has a disease. He's got leprosy. And uh, in one of his raiding parties, he's managed to get a little Israelite girl come and is a maid to his wife. And instead of this little girl being full of bitterness towards um, the Assyrian commander she says to her mistress do you know if the Lord Nahum wants to get well there's a prophet in Israel who can make him well gets told makes a trip goes to Israel speaks to the king has a bucket load of gifts out the front the king is furious you're trying to pick a fight with me and um, somebody sends uh, a message. Elijah sends a message and says, hey, you know, if you actually um, uh, want to come to me. And so there's an insignificant person telling Nahum, you need to go and see this prophet, Elijah. And the prophet Elijah knows he's outside his house when he arrives. And so all he does is send his servant out to tell him, go out, go and wash seven times in the river. The commander's furious. His servants say to him, if he asked you to do something great, you would have done it. How hard is it to wash? Toby, how hard is it to wash? How hard is it to get him into a bath? <laughs> Not always easy. And um, there's better rivers. 
let's go to the one he said. So he goes and he ducks, washes seven times and he comes back and he says, I want to give you a camel load train worth of goods and I want to give you clothing and I want to give you money. And the prophet says, no, not interested. In every way, in every part of that story, God is cutting this guy's pride down to nothing. Nothing. He has no status, no place, no thing to stand. He has run out. It is down to nothing. He has humbled him totally by servants telling him what to do. He is a commander. He tells people what to do. And he is servants telling him what to do. God will knock out our arrogance, our pride. You see, the thing that we really need is grace. In the story about um, taking bread, you need grace to take it. And God provides that grace. So the question then comes, what shall we practice? What shall we practice? One of the things I, I rem, I'm reminded of when it comes to bread and being in this place is that it is a cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the anchor of our life. Nothing else will satisfy apart from him. He is to be the centre of all of our worship. The other one is, it is like having or reminding us of the presence of of the Lord Jesus being with us. There is one thing practical that you can do. Another illustration where bread is used is, is in the Lord's Prayer, which is going to pop up right now. I'd like us to say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Stop. Give us this day our daily bread. It's like a double emphasis. Because it turns around and it says, give us today, this moment. The emphasis is either on the bread or on the moment. We need this bread. We need this particular piece of bread. We need it for this moment, this day. That double emphasis. Give us this bread, this day, right now. You see, the times that you need to know and to have the Lord Jesus in your life is every moment. This is a prayer to say for every moment of this day. I'm going to make a choice about something. Lord, give us now, this moment, what I need. The substance, the sustenance, the restoring, the forgiving, the hope that I need now, today, in this moment. I don't think I can go on any longer. Give it to me now. Please, this is a prayer where it says this sus substance that is only found in Jesus is needed for me now at this moment. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for what you teach us in your word about and you, the examples that you give us. How easy it is for us to go astray. Refresh our hearts as with your presence today, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song, and then you, we're going to have morning tea. But we're going to do it a little bit differently today, in that I'd like us, because we normally do this so formally, I'd like to do it a little bit informally. And so I'm going to give thanks 
um, for the morning tea and we're going to break the bread and we're going to pass it around. And you're just going to remain seated. We're going to sing this song, then we'll do that and we'll pass around the cup because it, they did it in their homes. You know, just as you go along and, and instead of asking people to come out and take this, I'm just going to pass it and let it go and let you guys pass it around to each other so that it'll be this is given to you. It's given from not just from me, from big wig, but from person to person.